this is the non-CMA portion of the meeting, so you don't have to believe anything I say. <laughs> I'm pleased to be here, first time. New organization, looks like it's off to a great, fantastic start, thanks to uh, Olivia and Holiday. Thank you, Holiday. And uh, many good years to come, many good things to happen. Just a real strong, I'm very impressed by what I see, um, since I do have a almost 20 year history with various organizations. Not all good. So, <laughs> here's what I do. Uh, started at Illinois, went on to Charleston for um, uh, my internship, two years at Baylor where I really got good infectious disease training, uh, on to Charlotte where I saw the first HIV case in 83 and did AIDS for like 23 years, picked up Lyme Berliosis is a funny, funny story, but um, that uh, is what led me to do this for about another 18 years. And in that time, it's, uh, you know, we've picked up about 13,000 patients, so we're, you know, we're up there. Moved to uh, D.C., or basically was kicked out of South Carolina and moved to D.C., uh, but happy there and doing well. Love D.C. is a, re uh, we're a destination practice for sure. So we love our patients from outside. We, we understand what sacrifice they have to get there and we're very sensitive to that, uh, really sensitive to that. We do, we, got, we fired insurance a long time ago. We had to because this disease, uh, which should be its own specialty and discipline and hopefully will in my lifetime become its own specialty and discipline and we'll talk about that later, requires a lot of time. So if somebody comes from Colorado to DC because they've been ailing for two to 20 years. We're not gonna spend 30 minutes with you, we're gonna spend two and a half hours. And you're gonna bring your records and we'll get details and then we're gonna clean that up and then we're gonna do it again. And the next time we'll refine and get it right. And then we've got a template to work with, that's how we do it. Um, and that's the only way to do it, quite honestly, with this illness. So, um, we have about 500 International patients growing. I have a large contingent in the UK. I was just in the UK in June, late June. I was their guest and they had about 200 people there. And I was on stage for four and a half hours and broke it up with uh, cold cases. I examined a patient on the stage and uh, showed a couple movies. And <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> and uh, gave my slides and, and then did Q&A. And it was a very long, exhausting day, but very productive. They did a wonderful job. Uh, but really, I appreciate the opportunity. Lyme Wayfair is a series I started in 2014 at iLads. I no longer belong to iLads. Um, but the, the term came to me, and I think it suits very well. People are lost and looking and wandering about, looking for care and sometimes, and finding their own way sometimes, and sometimes that's a little dangerous. So Maslow has his critics, the psychologists, but in terms of self-actualization, which is the best we hope to do with our lives, very few of us reach that, but below that we have basic needs and we have psychological needs. And I just want you to think about either yourself, if you're the patient or your, your um, family member, friend, spouse, isn't this true, though, how things just kind of go away, the self-esteem just goes away, and the fact that you can't interact with your environment kind of goes away, and you lose more and more and more, and then you start to lose more and more support mechanisms and ways to compensate, and pretty soon, you, you know, you're down to your, your safety, and if you don't have that support group along the way, you're really in trouble. So, this is the despair that uh, is common to this illness and the urgency. And so I don't need to say much about this. I have patients from each of these countries and um, many, many more. Okay, so you've heard, what you've heard all day today, I'm gonna say some things that are different uh, based on 18 years and 13,000 patients. And you, you don't have to agree with this and I can't prove any of it. But guess what? A lot of your speakers today can't prove anything they said either. Uh, here's what I believe. I believe that the spirochete infects virtually all of us at some time or another. I think as a corollary, the incidence of in-unit transmission is grossly underestimated. It's not measured, can't be tracked, can't be followed. 
There is nothing to contradict this statement. We have no serial prevalence studies of any kind in our country um, that say, okay, you know, so many, what per, some percent of you have been infected with Lyme spirochi. We know how unreliable the two-tier testing is and any other testing for that matter that's based on serology. Because serology is totally tied into the robustness of the immune response. And this is an immunosuppressive disease. Plus, you have to have the right spirochete. You have to have the right cell model. Testing was meant to assist the patient to confirm a suspicion. It wasn't meant to be the uh, end all. Testing is supposed to help us, not be what is happening here. So if you have four, if you have nine bands on a test because you're the, a concert to a very sick patient, but you feel fine, to me, you got a really nice, robust, you've been exposed, but you got a nice, robust immune system. You're, you're hitting on all cylinders. You don't necessarily have to be sick. So we don't have any seroprevalence studies, which begs the question, why in the hell are we get, doing another Lyme vaccine? Who are the, who's the population that's susceptible? We don't know. The last time they did it, they picked the people at risk who, in terms of their occupation, and a bunch of them got sick and there was a class action suit. It wasn't because the vaccine failed. It was because there was a class action suit. It was a horrible vaccine, poorly conceived, and this one's just a polyvalent version of the old one. Anyway, I don't want Holiday to get mad at me. So, like the herpes viruses, once this thing gets in the body, trust me, folks, it's in. Only has to get in once. And we've already had comments about, you know, how many species there are. We have no clue what's in us, how many different strain species, genus species are in us. Okay, here's number two. And this is going to sound strange to you, but I believe it with all my heart. You know I believe in Lyme Beluriosis complex. I was the first one to say, hey, we got a bunch of pathogens, not just the spirochete. As bad as the spirochete is, it needs help. And once it gets loose, Katie bar the door. Babesia is the driver. Babesia is the boogeyman. Babesia is prevalent. Babesia is not 20%, as I think Dr. Alcott said. I'm sorry, John, it's not. Testing line, maybe, but it is the boogeyman, trust me. It's what makes this thing go in this context, at least in the Western world. Um, and the third thing is, frighteningly, if you have a chronic inflammatory state, which is bad enough because of all the neuroinvasive stuff it does, neurodestructive stuff it does, it's bad enough for that. But what it does, in my view, is liberate or weaken the immune system such that you're now expressing other diseases of a chronic nature that um, have no known etiology. So if you look at the 18 or 20, uh, 20 to 25 chronic illnesses with no known etiology, none of them have an, only two, there are actually two where we have an etiology. They're both infections. H. pylori and AIDS. The rest of them we don't know. Do you, what's the etiology of any of the neurodegenerative disorders? ALS, MS, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, la, 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 la. What's the etiology of any rheumatologist? Go to rheumatologist. What causes this, doc? Mm, I don't know. Let's put you on some steroids. La, 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 la. Whole range of dermatologic and GI disorders, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we've seen... We haven't done the study because I don't have the resources to do these kinds of things. But all we'd have to do is look at a consort of the next two or 300 patients and, and you know, we, they have these criteria and we say, well, so many of these are going to have an inflammatory colitis. Usually it's nonspecific, not Crohn's, although a lot of people get called Crohn's. How many have migratory arthritis, which is called rheumatoid? How many have come in with MS, with lesions in the brain? but also have auto dysautonomy and also have uh, joint pain and severe peripheral neuropathy that don't really fit MS. It's interesting, the MS uh, Academy decided 20 years ago that uh, cognitive failure was a part of MS all of a sudden. Before that, it won. So, so I find that very interesting. So I'm not gonna get into each and every one of these diseases, but I just wanna give you that overview. Uh, and the talking points today, which will be relatively fast, uh, Babesia and the expression of LBC, um, a correlation which I just mentioned, uh, our approach to treatment, I'll give you a nice two or three slide summary of how we approach things. And then I, I really have <clears throat> a lot of information for you on what are the conditions, <clears throat> existing conditions that we recognize or discover in our patients that either preclude therapy 
or complicate therapy greatly. We've learned a great deal. We have a list of about 25 conditions that's never been published. And then because I talk today about um, um, the politics, you know, we're talking about, you know, some of the things that have happened and the malicious abuse and interference of uh, physicians to seek this out. You know, back in the 90s, the, ben the benchmark uh, physician or uh, researchers did really good work. They were unimpeded. The clinicians uh, in this field have never done anything worth anything, really. It's all been fluff, in my view. There are a lot of people that hate me for saying these kinds of things. And, uh, you know, I'm used to that, being hated. And, um, but it's not always that way. Um, so, um, this is Harley. She's got I Love JSC. Her, her mom went through therapy, and this is her way of thanking us, which was a darling. And next one, I have a jockey who's very thankful, so they named this thoroughbred Philly Jemsek. And uh, poor horse. <laughs> it's a poor horse. The name Jemsek. Uh, anyway. All right. This disease, I mean, we all know the spirochete's been around forever, but this disease has not been around forever. And we're going to talk about environment and some other things in a minute. This disease has not been around forever. There's never been a, the precedent for this kind of human suffering and involvement where there's such a devastating, thoroughly efficient way of destroying both the central and peripheral nervous system. Never. It's never happened. And um, it's changed. It, it's a whole new change. So. You know what? We talk about all these things. Uh, guess what? What we talked about today has no agreed upon name. What do you want to call it? Doesn't have a name. Doesn't have a definition. Somebody wrote a two page thing with, you know, uh, 75 line items. I mean, it has to be something that is workable. So we don't have that. So it's very hard to talk about an illness where. You know, communication is part of understanding what you're telling me and, you, you know, you, you, you give me a phrase or a paragraph and I understand what you mean because it resonates and la, la, la. We don't have that. And so um, here it is. I mean, this is what I've used in very narrative terms. Chronic, relapsing, and otherwise unexplained encephalopathy, uh, arthritic or periarthritic or emphysopathy is a better term and peripheral neuropathy. So if you have all those three things, there's not any other disease that really rises to that standard. These could be the three major criteria. I'm all for having a few minor criteria, just like with rheumatic fever, you know, when you don't understand quite what's going on. EM, ACA, things like that. But, you know, we need to get our act together and get a name for this. I call it complex because it's, um, it's, uh, has uh, immunosuppressive manifestations, it's polymicrobial, um, and it, there are at least six pathogens, and I, I, I'm naive to think, I would never be naive enough to think that it's only six. But I think as you go down the list, <clears throat> seven through 12 and 13 through 18 are less um, indigenously pathogenic, if you will. They can cause opportunistic infection, but less so than the other six. And I think that, but I think they play a role. We just, we just don't know. Um, but I concentrate on six, and then we know we have a very sloppy gut with unknown parasitosis. Um, and I don't use antivirals. I use antivirals for 20 years treating HIV. If we had to use antivirals, we'd be in big trouble. Now, if somebody comes in on uh, Valtrex saying they think it helps them, fine. I have no problem with that because it's a benign drug. Um, it is immunosuppressive. Um, it's not like AIDS, but it does depress the immune system. It's associated with low CD4 and CD8 counts. The T cells don't talk to the B cells. The immunoglobulins are depressed as well. This is not reported, and it happens all the time. Fortunately, from a functional point of view, our patients don't get the same sort of opportunistic uh, infections that patients with HIV did. They get their share of issues. They get hurt, they get shingles early on, they can get overwhelming candidiasis, but they don't get pneumocystis and they don't get some of the CMV retinitis and they don't get some of the horrible things the AIDS patients got. Now, it is multi-systemic. I think you've got a, a, 
a taste of the fact that it invades all cell types or many cell types. I'll, I'll say more. And I use the term multi-compartmental neurologic, which means every part of the brain, every part of the spinal cord, which are the, comprise the central nervous system together, and every part of the peripheral nervous system can be involved. Every part. It's astounding. That means that from a neurologic point of view, you're going to see some bizarre stuff, and you're going to see bizarre combinations, and you're going to see variations on the theme, and you better know your neurology, and you better know what's happening with the patient, and you better know what meds work, and you better know what, what, what they're doing in terms of detox, and you better know how to detox that patient. Um, so um, the uh, OPM uh, is a precursor to Social Security. This was, we've redacted this, but I thought it was kind of cute. Um, <laughs> It's from the government. So we get a lot of disability letters using Lyme Berlase's complex, just so you know. I, wrote, I did this in 2003, believe it or not. I don't know if it shows up there. I guess it does. I just tooled around with this. And I, back then, I was thinking congenital. I was thinking infection. I was thinking sexual. And I was thinking, you know, arachnids do this, but, you know, um, non-arachnids probably do some. It's kind of like having anal sex in AIDS. It's, more, it's the most efficient way to transmit the virus, but it's not the only way, it's just the most efficient way. So Ixodes is the most efficient way to transmit it if you haven't had it before. Um, but once it's in, it's in. Point, point is. I think it's hard to get through life without being infected. Then the question is, okay, how come some people get sick and some don't? Coming up. Before, before we get into that, to make the point about living good up in Fort Collins, I don't, I'm not sure if she's still working, but she did a seminal piece. This is 13 years ago. And what she said was, you know, she took all the neural uh, cell types, support cells, et cetera, et cetera, all 30 of them, overlaid it with B1. Everyone got infected. And she also said in, in 06, in Fort Collins from NIADID, uh, it can result in serious acute and late-term disorders. Okay, well, what's the CDC missing? This is 13 years ago. This drives me crazy. Uh, so in all the cell tested, everyone got infected, and there must be something that protects the, the, the spirochete. Well, yeah, there is. Real quick, we'll go through my friend here and compare it to this one. This is in the order of uh, spirochetia, which is the most um, advanced order of bacteria we have prokaryocytes. So this has, it's not the only bacteria to have linear chromosomes, but one of the few. It has 132 lipopropene dedicated genes, and that, that means it can be changeable compared to 22 for syphilis. Um, it, has, it has genes that no other, 90% of genes no other cell has, and it can, it can infect arachnids, insects, small and large mammals, reptiles, avian. Can't find it infecting fish, but I wouldn't put it past it. And Treponema pallidum is restricted to the human species. There's the thermophilic problem with that. Real quick, this, I just want to make the point about the lipoprotein being right here. This is a gram-negative cell with lipopolysaccharide. This is tachoic acid gram-positive. These are your spirochetes. They're expressed in the outer membrane here with this lip lipoprotein, which we'll talk about. Lipoprotein upregulates uh, through sol soluble CD14, which uh, upregulates through T uh, toll receptor 2 and 4 and drives a vicious uh, inflammatory cascade. And let me just pass this up. Suffice it to say, it's, it's much more um, intense than the lipopolysaccharide. So this is the Dr. Herxheimer. His cousin, Jerish, one was in Austria and one was in Germany or Hungary, I can't remember. They treated syphilis in the 1800s with business, ar bismuth, arsenic, and um, mercury. They would get the die-off phenomenon. People who had secondary syphilis with, sensory, with, uh, with uh, Louis, the secondary phase, they'd have lesions. They would pop up like little volcanoes. They'd have flu-like symptoms and fever and sweat for two or three days, and then go back. That was a Herxheimer. They saw it all the time. That's where the word came from. And with our disease, with syphilis in the brain, obviously it's just slow motion. It's like, or, you know, like this, this barricade, but really is on steroids here. Um, 
So all this activity, unfortunately, is happening in the nervous system as well as other systems. That's, that's one of the challenges. So this is Big Mama here. Big Mama. She's in you, and we need to get her out. All right, so we have a chronic inflammatory state. Chronic is the key word. It's on and on. It's 24-7. It does not let up. You try to take the edge off. You detox. You're still inflamed. And at some point, you can, look, people are mildly ill. You don't have to get antibiotics or herbals. Or special. You can sleep an extra hour. You can do a light gym workout. You can avoid gluten for the first time in your life. And you can do <clears throat> all of these things. You can meditate, and maybe you can get back to baseline, which is where you want to be, because you want to be right here. Now, every day we wobble, because just me speaking up here, I'm creating radicals, okay? My liver's going to neutralize those. But if you have overwhelming infection, uh, the glutathione from your liver has been neutralized and exhausted. It's gone. And you just, you just flare on. You just flame on. Flame on, flame on, flame on. You do everything you can to get the flame down. So... Um, Let's do just a fact and hypothesis page. So beryllium, let's, this is a fact I'm saying, is a genetically endowed higher order bacterium with multiple life forms constituted by multiple genus species, multiple strains, none of which have been adequately characterized and correlated with the expression of human lines. In other words, if there are 200 um, species and maybe 60 are infectious, we don't know which of the 60 does what. Is there really a difference between number 3 and number 14 or 26? We don't know. It might be nice to know that. And it would also be nice to know how many are infecting in a particular case. No question, as I said before, this is a confluence of organisms. I call it the profile. And then finally, tropisms is the term that you may be familiar with. It has to do with the proclivity of a particular pathogen to lock on to a certain cell type. So streptococcus in the epithelium, mening meningococcus in the meninges. Uh, gonococcus in the, ureth uh, um, the um, urethra. So tropism for this uh, organism doesn't mean too much because it likes everything, but it likes the nerve cells most of all. But it also gets into fibroblasts. It gets into fibroblast. It gets into T cells. It gets into the endothelial cell. In fact, a lot of things get into our blood vessel wall lining, which is only one cell thick. Okay, here's a hypothesis, which I've made before. It's a commensal organism widely distributed. Genetic immunologic risk factors for disease play a role in disease susceptibility and expression of the disease. So if your immune system in a healthy person is here and you have a, your normal bacterial commensal load here and you've got a few potential pathogens, everything's fine. But the way I see it is that you get general erosion year after year and you may start to bob and weave actually. You know, where you're not so good for a few days or a few weeks and you compensate and you get a little bit better but you don't have that big buffer and margin that you should have. And it's because of the erosion of these pathogens and this gradual exhaustion of the immune system. Then, if you get a series of bad hits or a big hit, you go down. And from that point, the immune system is catching up. It makes noise, but it can't catch up, and you're in trouble. And guess what? The spirochete goes for it. It goes wherever it wants. It starts to make more and more trouble, more damage, and you get into a spiral where now you can't sleep, now you've got pain. You know, you know, now you've got overwhelming fatigue because you can't fire the mitochondria and make ATP. Your life's changing. And if, it's a, if the quicker you fall and the faster you fall and the deeper you fall, the harder it is to get back and you're in trouble. You won't get back without help. Okay, Babesia drives the bus. I really believe that. Um, I think it's the game changer. It's, it's the one that gives us the most trouble. I'll quickly go through this little parasite. You would think you could see it on a blood smear. It's, you can see it if you tag it. It's hard to see. It's not that plentiful. Um, it definitely suppresses the immune system. Hard to find any literature on that. I, I think we could prove that. Just show me the money, somebody, and you know we can do the studies, and we'll show you. Um, and it, it, this is a very interesting story. I don't know if Dr. Sappy is still here, but it's in the biofilm. So I'm going to tell you a little story. It'll take about two minutes. 
Um, five or six years ago, I was screwing around with biofilm. I knew biofilm existed. I was afraid of it because I didn't want to unleash things because I knew whatever I unleashed was going to cause trouble. And my poor patient's immune system couldn't handle it. So I was really kind of playing around. So I was, I'd do a little natokinase because it was mild. And I know serapeptidase was out there and lomokinase. I, you know, I knew all the things that were out there. But I wasn't real comfortable because I didn't feel like I could quantitate it or rely on it. So I don't know. I happened across an article from Montana Surgical Research Group, Montana. And they worked on these horrific wounds, um, amputees, diabetics, et cetera. And I read something about them using xylitol and lactoferrin as a way to break down biofilm because they were wondering if biofilm played a role in their infections. Duh. So, so I called the guy and I said, well, how's this work? He said, yeah, but you got to be careful with it. Just give a little bit. It's so much. We found that you get diarrhea after that. And it's just, we make it a paste. We take it by mouth, and it really has helped. And then I realized that Procter & Gamble had been putting xylitol and lactoferrin in their toothpaste and mouthwash for years because their biochemists had figured it out. Uh, well, xylitol and stevia, and erythritol for that matter, are sugar alcohols, sweeteners. So they're not calogenic. You know, they're not true saccharides, but they're very sweet. And so I took a set of patients that were quite stable and had been through a month, a year or so of therapy. I said, okay, I'd like you to try some xylitol and lactoferrin, but let's start slow and just take about a half teaspoon or a half teaspoon, and then next month a little bit more and then a full dose, and then come back and see me in three or four months, <clears throat> and just three days a month of antibiotics. So they were fine. They were functioning high level, 85 90%, but they were still in recovery. So I started this procession, and so... Um, First one comes back three or four months later. Hey, how you doing? What the hell did you do to me? I said, I feel like I just started all over again. I said, what do you mean? I feel awful. I got the sweats again. I ache. I can't stay awake. can't think. And because of a practice of examining the patient, at least perfunctorily, every visit, putting hands on the patient, I documented before when they start before they started there was no hepatomegaly or in uh, liver enlargement no splenomegaly. When I palpated this particular individual the next time the liver was swollen like this and the spleen was swollen like this all over again. And I said, "Uh-oh, I think maybe something came back." But maybe it has something to do with this or not. Except that it kept happening. So patient after patient would come in with the same story. Liver okay, three months of xylitol, liver not okay. And I said, holy crap, Babesia is in the biofilm. That's why people don't get better. We got to treat Babesia in the biofilm, and we got to be smart about it. And so from that point on, because xylitol was easily quantifiable and you knew what you're getting, it's synthetic, it's, it's synthesized from, the, from white bark, but also corn cobs. So it has to go through a synthetic enzymatic process or stevia, I think, is pretty much straightforward. So the, the, the mantra to our patients is, OK, we're going to use this in conjunction with the first part of our therapy. And then we're not going to pulse anymore. We're going to go in a kill zone, depending on where they are in the program. And then you're going to get a rest. And we're going to do this. And you are not to have stevia. You're not to have erythritol. You're not even to have a sucralose you know, at any other time. Anything that might compete with this and create chaos. And that's been our routine for five or six years. And it works. So you have to, so it's synchronized. We, we melt the biofilm while we treat, then we kill, then we rest. Okay? We may do some things to the gut in between, but this is necessary because the sucker's in the biofilm and it's hard to get out and you have to hit it hard and you have to, you have to tease it out of the biofilm. You have to melt that. All right, so this is a, um, Figure of, um, I've always, I, I'm fond of saying spirochete's the tip of the spear, but it doesn't go anywhere without Babesia in the blue. This is something that I'm rather proud of that we put together, um, which is a new, entirely new um, a graph. So the genesis of LBC and other associated diseases. So let's say, we, I've talked about our profile. We have to, I haven't talked about a lick here. 
Bartonella, but you all know they're there. I'm, you know, some the whole group, right? So, so here's our pathogen. So let's say it's all set up. So what makes people sick? Let's say you have the profile. Um, well, I thought the three major life determinants were your genetics, which you can't do anything about. This is how, if you're hit with an inflammatory load of any kind, some people do better than others. Some people have a really hard time, and that depends on their um, substitution polymorphisms in the genetic pathway, where none of us are perfect. We all have issues at certain points of the pathway. Then we look at lifestyle. Okay, well, if you work out and you eat right and you sleep right and you do, you do you know, good things for your health, you're less likely to get adverse consequences than if you're drinking Jack Daniels uh, bottle every day. Um, and so, and there are the stressors, not necessarily stressors, your life is hell because you're in a divorce or you, your job and you're just stressed to heck, you know, so the lifestyle is less than optimal. Down here we have the environment. Who knows? Do you realize there's a thousand new chemicals each year in our environment? Who knows? But I think it's safe to say that's not necessarily a good thing for the human biome. Um, and so uh, the toxic environment, mold could be included in that for sure. Mold is not the driver, sorry Richie, but it is a contributor, it's a, an accelerator, and it's a decelerant to, to healing. So poems is here, so you don't know what poems is. So this is something we've been doing for 15 plus years. So this isn't obviously an acronym. So I talk about poems has to be satisfied. We won't treat anybody until these are manageable. So pain, and there are three kinds of pain, nociceptive, uh, neuropathic, and regional or central pain. They all require different approaches. We do not use narcotics. Um, other, we have to have support in our support section. If you remember Maslow, uh, as, the, as you start to sink, you're going to need somebody to help you that knows what's going on with you every day and gives a, gives a crap about you. Uh, and then there are other comorbidities. There may be other infections or issues or uh, malabsorption or some, some awful thing that just needs to be handled before we go on. Uh, endocrine, we see a lot of endocrine metabolic issues, so we do our usual labs and, and make corrections. N nobody with this disease is happy. We start with a baseline of like the floor of this mood is like irritable, <laughs> okay? And then it gets worse. So, but 100% are irritable. And so we build from irritable. Hopefully it stays on the second floor, but sometimes it goes, you know, into some very bad places, not to be facetious, but. Um, and so that has to be managed or else we can't, the patient's not gonna do well. It's all about, we want success and we should be able to do it, you know, without, without uh, uh, you know, giving the patient an anesthetic every day. Uh, and sleep, the quality of sleep is absolutely essential. Our brain rinses at night, it's a metabolic organism, or organ, excuse me, that creates waste that has to be rinsed. Turns out our brain opens up at night and flushes. We have a tiny lymphatic system at the top and our brain flushes. If our brain doesn't flush, we carry toxins into the next day. And that occurs during deep sleep, stage three sleep. If that doesn't happen, you got a toxic brain the next day and it just builds. So the, we have to sleep. So there are a handful of medications we carefully choose, not named Ambien or Lunesta. So we don't use those, but we use, there are a couple of the neurotropics that work nicely, Trazodone, Seroquel, um, Mirtazapine. They get you in deep sleep. We use the most benign one. We start with something to start you into sleep and then promote sleep. So the question is, do you get to sleep or do you stay asleep? No, I can't do either. Well, you need something to get you into sleep. If we think there's a histamine issue, we'll start with Benadryl, that's easy. If we think there's a glutamate, so several neurotransmitters are excitatory, and so we'll try to identify what's what. So if you, do, if you wanna know if you have trouble with glutamate, drink a big thing of bone broth. If you're fine, you can do glutamate. If you think you have a problem with nitrite, have some red wine. If you're fine, you're probably okay with retent nitrite. <laughs> um, no, I'm being facetious. Not really, though. But <laughs> okay, I'll go quickly through here. You can read this, but it just shows the, the multiple manifestations that can occur and do occur in various parts of the brain. Now we're focused on the cortex. Now we're talking about the brain stem, which is hammered by this disease, by the way. Hammered. The, this disease really loves the brainstem and the cortex. Just loves it. Just loves it. And 
Then we have our limbic system, which is white matter. The top thing you see is the cingulate gyrus. We have the, the devil gland, the amygdala, is right here. We have our hippocampus, which gets hit. That's our memory, short and long term. Um, these, are, these are the ophthalmic, uh, ophthalmic uh, tracts. So, so this brain doesn't think, doesn't think at all. So it overrides the prefrontal cortex. So if it gets an urge, especially the amygdala, and you have startle or you do something that's just totally bizarre, when you're thinking, why am I doing this? You're still doing it. That's what's happening. So um, this is what we deal with. And this is what our patient's family deals with. And uh, it's, it's hard. So we, you know, we have to have a good explanation for... Um, Say, we can get you better. We have to calm down without you feeling drugged. If you feel drugged, that one's off the table. We'll try something else. But first you have to detox in this way, this way, this way, okay? Are you going to be a good patient? Do you check all the boxes? And there's our commoded brain, the limbic system. All right, here's our protocol. It would be maybe even foolish for me to give you every single thing we did because that's not appropriate. But I want to give you the concepts because they've been the same for a while. We're going to stabilize our patients, as we just talked about. We need to re reduce the inflammatory quotient and reduce CNS and PNS neuroirritability. We target our pathogens sequentially. We do combination pulsing therapy initially. Then we bring in biofilm. We prioritize our targets so Babesia gets targeted early on. And we do the synchronized degradation of biofilm. And in maintenance and recovery, some of the things that... Um, what the doctor said earlier today are interesting, the exosomal therapy or hyperbaric therapy or even some sort of stem cell therapy. If the science were there, I would think it would be okay, but only once the infections are purged. Only then, in my view, is, would it be effective. This is what I wrote to, along with P.J. Langhoff. Anybody know P.J. Langhoff? She is amazing. She's an amazing, productive person. Smart, smart, savant. Here's what I wrote in 2007, and if you can just read that, I'll read quickly with you. The insight into diagnosis treatment, so I'm writing to Tom Ryan, who worked for A.G. Blumenthal, and he asked me to help incredibly, because they hadn't really gotten to this work, even though it was sitting on his desk for a year. And I'm going, holy moly. So, so we wrote a couple of letters, it was volumes of work. I like to say I worked 100 hours on this, PJ worked 1,000 hours. She's got all 202 patents that the ideas say registered. She got each and every one on file. I have mine electronically. I wrote through the whole guidelines and I picked out their duplicity, their, their contradictions, and made comments and their errors. And then I wrote introductory letters saying, look, if things don't change, if the status quo remains the same, here's what's going to happen. And that was, that was 12 years ago. And it's, ha you know, nothing's changed. And it's, except, well, other than the epidemic getting intensely worse. Okay, the top line is what IDSA did for 2019. The, the recommendations mimic. I feel they've memorialized their guilt. They've seen 13 years of suffering and debate, and they haven't changed a thing. They say the disease doesn't exist. We're talking about this PLTS or whatever that means. I hate that word. I'm not to say there's no autoimmune phenomenon going on, but I hate that word. These people have continued infections, trust me. The word should be discarded. It's, it's like being politically correct in the medical word at Johns Hopkins or wherever this comes from. It's garbage. Um, so millions more are going to get infected by the time we get some action here. And the last comment the national and global epidemic of psychiatric illness, suicide, violence, substance abuse, and developmental disabilities in children and adults will skyrocket. And that is a strong statement. And Holiday, I didn't say that. That was, Rob Brand that was Bob Bransfield. So, strong statement. He is the most respected man in the field, in my opinion. So I guess I better quit. Sorry I couldn't do more. I had a whole lot more to say, but uh, maybe next time. Thank you. Mm -hmm.